We definitely got further and further away from society. And all of us knew that our way of life had to be concealed. Welcome to Ms. Mojo. And today, we're looking at the horrifying true story of Keep Sweet, Pray and Obey. That changed everything because it sent Warren on the run. He knew he was in trouble because the heat was increasing here in Arizona and in Utah. For this video, we'll be delving into the facts behind Netflix's shocking docuseries about the Fundamentalist Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and its president, Warren Jeffs. Did you watch the series? What did you think? Let us know in the comments. The Fundamentalist Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, FLDS, drew national attention in the late 2000s when its leader was put on the FBI's 10 Most Wanted Fugitives list. The police raids and trials that followed made international news. Warren Jeffs has been particularly agitated today uh, when it comes to some of the evidence that's been presented regarding his personal journals and writings and, and some of the, the documents that were admitted into evidence today. Although over a decade has passed, the FLDS has experienced renewed public scrutiny in the wake of the 2022 Netflix docuseries, Keep Sweet, Pray and Obey. Described as a real-life Handmaid's Tale, the series exposes the crimes, corruption, and horrifying culture of this polygamist cult. We didn't really leave our property in Salt Lake City. We didn't go to movies. We didn't go to theme parks or any kind of large gathering places. So there wasn't a lot of exposure to the outside world. A splinter group of the Mormon Church, the movement was founded by men who'd been excommunicated for continuing to practice polygamy. Polygamy is not a protected constitutional right. Plural marriage, polygamy, it's illegal. But as a practical matter, it is almost never prosecuted. Under pressure, the Mormon Church had advised against polygamy in 1890 so that Utah would be granted statehood. When some members continued to enter into plural marriages regardless, the church issued the Second Manifesto in 1904, threatening them with excommunication. Claiming that God wanted them to have multiple wives, excommunicated members went on to form their own community in Short Creek, now Colorado City, Arizona, in the 1930s. The FLDS split from the mainstream Mormon church a century ago and settled in Short Creek isolated in the desert, where they could practice polygamy and follow their fundamentalist faith undisturbed. The community also included the nearby town of Hilldale in Utah. The church had incredibly strict rules for members, who lived in relative isolation from the rest of society. When Warren Jeffs took over leadership in the 2000s, these rules became even more draconian. Women were forced to wear long prairie dresses that covered every inch of their bodies, and their hair had to be drawn back in a bun. They were reportedly made to pray every hour. In fact, the docu-series title Pray and Obey comes from a brick pattern featured on one of the community's buildings. The wives were required to pray every hour, getting down on their hands and knees and holding hands. Talking was not permitted. On the chimney, it says pray and obey. Right. And that's the message you'd see every day. Women had two purposes only, to be submissive wives and procreate. They were controlled and coerced, forced into underage marriages, and made to engage in non-consensual acts. I felt like this is everything that we were told was bad. Why, why is a man doing this, let alone the prophet of God doing this to me? Members were taught to keep sweet, which essentially meant to tamp down their emotions and do as they were told. Keep sweet, no matter what. That's the road to perfection. Girls who were considered unruly were married off in order to subdue them. In many cases, the men they were married to were significantly older. Warren Jeffs arranged all the marriages and controlled physical contact between husbands and wives. It's what's called the placement principle. You didn't court and decide who you were going to marry. Only the prophet could choose who you married. He decided which men were allowed to father children and punished male followers by reassigning their wives, children, and homes to other men. He himself reportedly had around 78 wives, although some have claimed 87, 24 of whom were underage at the time of their marriage. Told me that the prophet has called and my name was brought up and I was to be married but not to Joe. 
Punishments for breaking the rules were dire and could include being kicked out of the community and even one's home, without a dime or any knowledge of life beyond the cult. Warren Jeffs was kicking young boys out of the FLDS. I understand literally leaving them homeless. In the Netflix series, women who escaped the cult bravely speak out about their harrowing experiences under Jeffs' authoritarian rule. Warren had a saying, perfect obedience is led by a hair. Meaning, a hair is so thin, and true obedience meant that you could be led by a hair, and you would not break it. Much of the docuseries focuses on the man at the center of these horrifying accounts, Warren Jeffs. But who is he, and how did he come to hold such intense and terrifying power? Mother Marilyn always told the story about how Warren was close to death at birth, and that previous prophets came to her and revealed to her that he would survive and that Warren would be a very special person. Warren Jeffs took over leadership of the church from his father, who died in 2002. He consolidated his power by marrying most of his father's widows. Warren started marrying his own mothers after Rowan died. That was really messed up. That was hard for people like me to swallow, and uh, I, there was a lot of people that had a problem with that. I mean, who marries your mom? Under his rule, the cult became even more cut off from the outside world. He even ordered that children be pulled from public schools and homeschooled instead. Warren stood up in church and announced that they needed to shut down the public schools because we had to associate with apostates too much. Expelling dozens of senior followers, including the Short Creek mayor, Jeffs achieved total control and started aggressively exploiting young girls. I wasn't scared of death. I was scared of disobeying the prophet. Think about what I said, because I would have rather died than disobey. As one survivor explains, Jeffs completely isolated them. They didn't know a life beyond the cult walls. He called himself a prophet and declared that all his decisions came from God. However, one of the cult's victims, Elisa Wall, bravely blew the whistle. She had been forced to marry her cousin as a minor. I was quite defiant, and I just, I will not do this. I cannot do this. I cannot marry him. In 2005, Jeffs was indicted by a grand jury, but he was nowhere to be found. He'd gone on the run, becoming one of the FBI's most wanted criminals. By this point, Warren's basically a seasoned fugitive with cell phones and masks and disguises and credit cards and prepaid phone cards. He knew how to travel on the road. Reportedly, he continued to rule from afar, instructing his followers to send him money that was brought to him by his brother, Seth. Supposedly, Jeffs, who had fled with some of his wives, used that cash on extravagant trips and fancy parties. Ultimately, he was arrested during a routine traffic check in Las Vegas. And he said, Warren's been caught. I, I was a little bit at disbelief at first, and I, I remember asking, are you sure it's Warren? And when it became evident it was, I started to get fearful. It's important to note that this was far from the church's first run-in with the law. In 1953, Arizona State Police officers and National Guard soldiers raided the community, arresting everyone, including 236 children. 150 were not returned to their parents for over two years, while others were permanently removed from their parents' custody. However, the church continued regardless, leaving history to repeat itself. Do you all remember the day of the raid? Yes. I heard there were men with guns. Did you see people with guns? Yes. In April 2008, federal law enforcement agents raided the community's compound in West Texas. Over 400 children were removed in what became the largest child custody case in U.S. history. When the judge ordered those kids to be taken off the ranch, no one knew there were that many of them. There were three, four, five hundred kids out there. And suddenly, Texas had a tiger by the tail. However, a court of appeals ruled that Child Protective Services had to return the children to the compound due to insufficient evidence. The Texas Supreme Court has ruled that all the children should be returned to their parents. Later that year, 12 FLDS men were charged with offenses related to underage marriages, and six were eventually convicted of felonies. Meanwhile, Jeffs was held in prison for two years while awaiting his trial. There were several delays, but in 2011, he was finally sentenced to life in prison. Between 2007 and 2011, there was some confusion over who was now in charge of the church. 
In 2007, Jeffs' attorneys released a statement declaring he had resigned as president. He announced William E. Jessup as his successor. However, he reasserted legal control in 2011 and continued to run the cult from prison. And the minute he comes out, there's women there start taking notes and writing everything he says down from the moment he starts talking. So he has means of getting information out of the prison. Today, Jeffs is incarcerated in a unit near Palestine, Texas. He won't be eligible for parole until at least July 2038, by which time he'll be 82 years old. Supposedly, he still believes he was wrongly convicted and has many supporters who agree. These days, FLDS numbers have dwindled, but remarkably, the cult is still around, although it keeps a low profile. Its devotees believe that Jeffs is a wrongly incarcerated prophet, and there are offshoot communities in Mexico and Oklahoma. Still thousands and thousands of FLDS members. The church's compound in Texas was seized by the state in 2014, having been deemed contraband as a place that had been used to facilitate criminal conduct. Basically, the government went in and, and basically declared that it was being used for criminal enterprise, and therefore they have seized it, and there's no FLDS living there at all. Another of Jeff's compounds in Phoenix, Arizona, was obtained by his former wife, Brielle Decker, who managed to escape the cult. With Pastor Luke W. Barnett, she transformed the mansion into a refuge for people in need, including former members of the FLDS. She says she wants to be there for others who flee the church. Netflix's docuseries tells the story of these women and their suffering under FLDS control. The director, Rachel Dretzen, explained that she wanted to show how brave and badass they were for leaving everything they knew behind and starting over. This is their story. Do you agree with our picks? Check out this other recent clip from Ms. Mojo. And be sure to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified about our latest videos.